The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Galatia, said, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. In the life of a believer, one who is a follower of Jesus Christ, they have made a commitment of their life to Him, putting all their faith in what Jesus did at the cross as their only hope, our forgiveness of sin, relationship to God, eternal life in heaven. What happens is that God the Holy Spirit comes to reside in the life of that person. And as life is continually, evermore surrendered to Him, there's a fruit that begins to develop. The fruit of the Spirit begins to grow and, and produce. And the longer you're a believer, the more evident the fruit of the Spirit should become in your life. And if it's not becoming more evident, then we're missing something. Somewhere we're coming up short. We need to grow. Now, some of the fruit of the Spirit, it's easier to come by than others. Some of these, maybe for me, would come more naturally than would come for you. Some are going to be easier for you. Just Maybe sometimes just the bent of your life is inclined in a certain way that, that you can immediately embrace certain ones of the fruit of the Spirit. And others just come with great pain. Now, as I looked at the, the fruit of the Spirit, and we're spreading these out, talking about, okay, look at the calendar, look at the staff. Who's going to share these different messages? I really tried, as I looked at the calendar, to down well, download or unload this one on one of the other staff members. Uh, and uh, because it's not really one of my favorites, so the fruit of the Spirit, patience. Patience, our topic for today. And, and yet, uh, they let me down. I find myself coming up from my deathbed today to talk about this because of the nature of our staff. Now... Uh, th this, is, this is one of those places where God's been working on me at multiple levels for a long time. And, and I would say, as with a lot of the fruit of the Spirit, uh, I, I'm certainly not where I used to be in relationship to this one, but uh, I'm not where God wants me to be either. God's still not nearly done with me in the area of patience. I want to give you some examples of that. Uh, God's used my opportunities to, to minister, in ministry in Africa to develop patience in me because just the nature of cross-cultural ministry. Uh, I have often said that uh, I need Africa a lot more than Africa needs me. And there are things that God does in my heart, moves in me, and changes in me each time I go, develops more abundantly in me. And one of those is most definitely going to be patience. Our format for, for missions, we, we really, we always want to, we want to partner with a local church. We want to partner with local believers, not just swoop in and do something and disappear, but we want to be tied to local believers. That we're going to be there for a short time, but somebody's going to be there when we're gone, and that's when we partner with local churches, and we focus on the gospel, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, making disciples. So, uh, this last summer in Zambia, there were three of us from this church that were at one particular church. Other folks from our church and other American churches were spread out between different mission points, different churches. And the three of us tied to one particular church, we uh, had a great experience, wonderful believers and spirit-filled folks, loved Jesus and loved their city. And that was wonderful. Now, the cultural part of it was a different challenge for someone who is so time conscious, as, as is my case. Uh, and so, each day, at the end of the day, after we'd been out, we came back, we'd share, here's what God did, here's where God was at work, here's what God did today, and we'd celebrate those things, have a time of worship and celebration, thanksgiving to the Lord. Then we'd set the expectation for the next day's ministry and mission, and then We'd say, all right, tomorrow morning, we're going to arrive at the church and begin no later than 8.30 in the morning. 
So you need to be here by 8.30. At 9 o'clock, we will leave and go out to share the gospel. We'll spend some time in prayer, some time in worship together, some time in spiritual preparation. Then we're going out into the city. <clears throat> so the next day we'd arrive, three of us, uh, sometime 8.15, 8 o'clock. 8.30, building's still locked. 9 o'clock, building's still locked. There's nobody there but us chickens, and we can't go very far without them. Uh, and so we're waiting for our partners to get there. Because uh, culturally, uh, time is just a different animal in, uh, in Africa. It develops a lot of patience for me. That first time I, I went to serve in an Afri East African country, they, they told me their favorite, favorite sayings is, Americans have all the watches and all the clocks, and Africans have all the time. As I thought about this topic of patience, as preparing the sermon, my office is, is just, our administration building is right over here, and uh, my office is on the second floor. It looks out on this building. And uh, as I was looking at this building, thinking about this message, it was reminded, uh, my friend Jimmy Moore remembers this very well. He was chairman of our building and land committee, building this building. And I remember 2001 so well. And it was September 2001. And we had prayed and planned and met and sac so many of you who were here in those days sacrificially given to build this house of worship. And we were so excited. We wanted to be in when school started. That's a natural time to kick off all, all things new. And we wanted to be in here when school started. So early September and this building looked just about the way it does right now except for one detail. There were no interior doors. Now, here's the deal about interior doors that grew patience in me. So excited, so much leaning into this building and this facility and all that it, that it offered to our church as a new day in ministry here. You can't get a certificate of occupancy if you don't have interior doors. But somehow the architect, he'd signed off on the wrong doors. And we had light ash-colored doors that arrived. And we had to send them back, and then they going to take, so with this building completely ready, except for the doors, we waited for weeks for now the right doors to be delivered to this place. And it grew a lot of patience in me. I still remember when September the 11th came in 2001. We had this incredible tool sitting right here, and we couldn't make use of it. Uh, Patience meant that I didn't do physical harm to the architectural team. Uh, that was one of the first, my early steps in patience in that particular time period in our church's life. Uh, another place where God grows patience in me is in travel. I'm not a good traveler, uh, particularly not when it comes to air travel. Some of you have done some air travel. Some of you have done some international air travel. You, you know how that process works and the adventures that come with, with air travel these days. It's a, it's a practice in patience. It's a series of opportunities to wait in lines. You wait in line maybe to check a bag. You wait in line at security. And security is such an adventure, especially post 9-11. Security is a whole different world. And some of you have your global entry pass and you just pass right on through security. The rest of us uh, ordinary humans, we... We find ourselves in security lines, and you, you get in line, and you're behind, you're behind a person that somehow, in spite of all the warnings, in spite of signs everywhere, they, they take their carry-on bags, and they put it on a conveyor belt, and they send it through, and they're, they, they're just not aware that you cannot, airlines, both domestic flights and international flights, really frown on flamethrowers and chainsaws and buoy knives being in a carry-on bag. And so it's all shut down because I looked at all the lines and I said, this is an express line right here. And that's the line I'm in behind Mr. Chainsaw Guy. And so I stand there and wait. Of course, I'm having to hold my pants up because my belt's somewhere in there with the chainsaw. I'm sitting, standing there in my bare feet, just hoping someday, somehow, I'm going to make it through security. Well, then you finally get to security, and then you go to the gate. Now, I've been at several gates this summer. Rhonda and I love to travel. We're going to have opportunity in a few days if I live. And, and so, 
you get to the gate. Now, I thought through this process because I went through several different airports around the world. Uh, and uh, here's how it works everywhere. Boarding begins. We're about to begin boarding. And everyone stands up. Everyone stands up. And then he said, now we're going to begin pre-boarding. Whatever that means. So here's how I've written this down because I, I heard it several times. We're going to begin pre-boarding with those who need assistance. Those who uh, are assistants who need pre-boarding. We're going to board first class. And we're going to board business class. And then we're going to board no class. And <laughs> private first class. Properly tattooed passengers. We'll, we'll have our gold card members now. And our platinum card members. And our plaid card members. Passengers who... By the way, we'll, we'll, now we invite all passengers who aren't even on this flight, but they're just lost in the airport. Come on up and see if you can clog up the works for the rest of us. And now we'd like to welcome aboard those passengers traveling with small children, those passengers acting like small children, those people who need assistance, those people who are planned to pretend to need assistance so you can get on earlier. And for those of you who haven't flown maybe in 10 years or so, just please wander confusedly toward the gate. Now, then it comes up my turn. At this time, we're going to begin general boarding. Okay, well, I'm general boarding typically. And you have, a, you have your boarding pass that says, you know, group one, group two, group three. So now we'll begin general boarding. And we'd like for all those with a boarding pass that says group one to please approach the gate. And then immediately they say, or... If you're in group two or group three or group four or group 50, we really don't care when you get on the plane. We're just, we're just saying this to make us feel better about the whole process. So have at it. Then you get on your airplane. And you're, you're, you're weary. You've been standing for a good while. And air, there are only 10 of you left by the time all the pre-boarding is done. And so you get on the plane. You have your carry-on bags. And as you go down the aisle, you stop. You wait, because there's some woman, she's, maybe she's building a nest up there, maybe, maybe it's a science fair project she's trying to finish up for her children, but she's working away up there, oblivious to the fact there are, you know, a hundred people behind her as she plays in the overhead bin, and finally she sits down, and you get past her, and you get to your seat, and you plop down in that big, roomy, comfortable seat, and where, where eventually you know you're going to get to push the button and lean back. Oh, okay, now I'm comfortable. And you sit down, and the plane takes off, and as soon as you were airborne, there's, there's this person in front of you, they just took three sleeping pills, and they're already unconscious and snoring, and somehow their seat reclines all the way, and next thing you know, they're just in your lap, and welcome to the next several hours of traveling together, and that's the nature of air travel. And as that person snores loudly, in your lap, you take a deep breath and you say, the fruit of the Spirit is patience. Now, I like to read a passage of Scripture. Not often we have a Sunday where we talk about Job and Lamentations on the same day, but Lamentations chapter 3 is where I want to read today. And this is a book in the Bible that most people probably don't have anything highlighted and you sure ought to have one verse out of Lamentations highlighted, and we're going to read that one verse here in just a moment. Now, in, in your Bible, you have Isaiah, Jeremiah. Those are two big books. They're easy to find in the Bible. Once you get past the Psalms and Proverbs, you're going to, you're going to end up with a couple of more big books, uh, and one of those is going to be Jeremiah, and Jeremiah also wrote a book called Lamentations. And Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 is where we want to read today. Here's what it says. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. Now, verse 25 is key. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul who seeks Him. 
It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth to wait, to wait. And waiting is what we don't do well. And waiting requires the fruit of patience. Many times in the Bible we're told to wait upon the Lord and we're not good at it. There's a story of a guy named Saul. He's the first king of Israel. And uh, Samuel, the prophet, he anoints Saul as king and they're about to go into battle a little later and, and Samuel says this. Go down before me to Gilgal. Behold, I'm coming down to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what to do. Well, Saul wasn't good at waiting. And he felt like Samuel was taking way too long. So he decided to take it upon himself to do what only the priest was supposed to do. And that's to offer sacrifices to the Lord. They were... They were doing this sacrifice in preparation for battle. It was a big deal. They needed God's favor, God's blessing, God's help. And Saul decided to take things into his own hands. And and as a result, the favor and blessing of God was removed from Saul. Because waiting for the Lord is not optional. Now as I thought about that, I thought about waiting and So much of life, if you notice this, so much of life is spent in between. Here's where I am, and here's where I'm going and where I want to be. And meanwhile, I'm in the in-between time. And a lot of life is lived in between the the here and the what's coming next. And most of us, we spend a lot of time anticipating what's ahead. We're always looking around the corner. Uh, to see what, what's before us. Oh, when I graduate from high school, when I graduate from college, when I find that special somebody, when I get my first full-time job, when I get that dream job where I really want to invest a, a large portion of my life, when I get to retirement. But there's always a something else out there. Meanwhile, we are in between waiting. Well, one thing is for certain. In this present time, God has a purpose for each of us in the in-between times. God has a purpose for each of us. And that's where we are in the present. Now, some of you, you came in and there are things that you're waiting for. You're waiting for test results. You're waiting for uh, a meeting. You're waiting for an opportunity. You're waiting for for God to bring some things together. You're, You're waiting for some mark on the calendar. And some of those things, some of those things, they're not bothering you at all. And some of those things, they're making you nuts. And they're trying your patience and, and, and they're pulling at your resolve. And I don't know what you see on your horizon just now, but I do know God has a purpose always in times of waiting. And if nothing else, it is to develop the fruit of patience in us because it is a Christ-like characteristic that should mark every person who names the name of Christ. There's a guy named G. Campbell Morgan. He was writing about a time of waiting for the Lord. And he said this, waiting for God is not laziness. Waiting for God is not going to sleep. Waiting for God is not the abandonment of effort. Waiting for God means first, activity under command. Second, readiness for any new command that may come. And third, the ability to do nothing until the command is given. We live in an age of impatience. We're impatient in traffic. We're impatient in line. We're impatient waiting for food service. Impatient waiting for marriage. Biding our time. Biding our time. Waiting. Being patient. Maybe one of the most countercultural things that a follower of Jesus Christ can do in this day and age. Because we, as a people, are so anxious and so pushy. We see plenty of examples in the Bible. In the Old Testament, there are examples. The psalmist, it says, Psalm 40, verse 1, they waited patiently for the Lord. They encouraged their readers to do the same, wait patiently for the Lord, Psalm 37, 7. We have a guy named Abraham, the father uh, of uh, God's people, the father of faith-filled people. In Hebrews 6, 15, it says, having patiently waited and obtained the promise. That's the testimony of Abraham. It says, Then uh, also uh, of him, those who through faith and patience 
inherit the promises. And then most importantly, the example of Jesus as the perfect example of patience. Here's what it says. Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. When Jesus displays his patience, it shows us a couple things. It shows us God is very patient. You know, God's patient. He wishes none should perish, but all should come to repentance. He is, he is patient at his core. All the fruit of the Spirit are on greatest display in the life of Christ, in our Father in heaven. They're, they're all seen on a regular basis. But see, Jesus is doing this as fully human, too. And as he does it as a man, he demonstrates what it looks like when we're living a life of patience with the people around us. So, I want to share just a few quick things, five things. Specific situations where God will empower us to wait. He'll empower us to be patient. And if, if not empower us, give us opportunities to get there. Because always, in the fruit of the Spirit, it's often the opposite of the fruit where we grow in the fruit. We have to be put in a position where we're going to be stretched. We're going to be pushed. And patience is lived out in a real life world. So five things. Here's the first one. Patience is going to happen. It's going to grow. It's going to be challenged with other people. Sometimes we think about patience in relationship to circumstances. When this circumstance changes, then everything's going to be great. But patience, even with the circumstances, is wrapped around people. We have a personal God, and He created a personal universe. And our daily circumstances, even when they feel isolated from everyone else, are inevitably tied to people, shaped by people. And to be increasingly patient people, we're going to have to deal with actual people, with real life human beings. When the apostle urges us in Ephesians 4, he says, walk in a manner, You're pursuing your calling, walk in a manner worthy of Christ. To live this Christian life in a way that really is the way he designed it to be lived. He does it as an other-oriented uh, objective. He says, I therefore, Paul's writing, I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And here's what that looks like. With all humility and gentleness, with patience. And then he amplifies on patience. Bearing with one another in love. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Patience relates to other people. We're also called to cultivate compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience as Christ followers. And again, that same word, bearing with one another. Patience bears with other people. And here's where patience gets to be difficult. When other people don't share our pace. That means sometimes they want to go faster than we want to go. And sometimes they want to go more slowly than we want to go. Pace is one of the places that's going to challenge our patience. In their practices. Just what's important. What they do and how they do it. Amazingly, one of the things I learned when I got married is Rhonda did things differently than I did. She does them wrong, right? Isn't that what that means? I can say that with authority because she's, she was in the first hour when they don't share our priorities other people have different priorities than we have and that's always going to challenge our patience and then just sense of timing uh, well I think we ought to start now well I think we need to do this first and timing is another place where patience is challenged in relationship to other people and that's true in our homes it's true in our workplace it's true wherever we are we urge you, brothers, Paul said, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with them all. Because people are a mess. You are a mess, just in case you weren't aware of that. I am a mess. And it's going to take a lot of patience for messy people to get along with one another. Second thing, patience in doing good. To get more specific, one way that patience orients on others is by enduring in doing them good. Christian good deeds are personal. And it involves people. And it doesn't work as fast as I wish it would for other people. Now, I, I, love, I love taking my time working on me. But with other people, I want them to get it right the first time. And get it turned around. And get it going the way God intends for it to go. 
But sometimes it's not the way it works. Jesus told a parable about a, a sower who went out to sow. And he's scattering seed, sees the word of God. And some of the soil lands on good soil. And this is what he says about the good soil where God's word lands. As for that good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. That the fruit of the gospel itself comes because you are patient. That, that God's word, when it is planted for discipleship purposes of spiritual growth, happens because we are patient. We want God to be patient with us and we must be patient with others in relationship to doing good. And it doesn't happen quickly. We want a quick fix. We want to just put a band-aid on things and everything's great. But most of the challenges we're going to face in relationship to people and doing good for others is going to take time. No significant long-term fruitfulness in this world comes without obstacles and resistance. So if we're going to serve other people, We're going to encounter friction soon enough. Patience is a virtue of the soul that helps us persevere in doing good. And we do not get weary in worthy causes. Even when there's opposition. Even when it's just hard work. Even when we grow weary in the work. This is one of the things, uh, listening to my friend uh, Steve Besner, Houston Northwest, is that this isn't going to all be fixed this week. Life can go on, maybe in North Texas for the most part. But down, down that direction, this is going to be a process of months and months. And patience means we don't grow weary in doing good. Patience in leadership, and particularly when we're talking about spiritual leadership. One of the most striking truths about patience in the Bible is its pairing with leadership. I was amazed at how many times in the Scripture I found those two things hand in hand in God's Word. What we find is that being patient is not a prerequisite to being a believer in Christ. It is a prerequisite to spiritual leadership of God's people. And that's true if you're a spiritual leader with your family, with a group of friends, in your Bible fellowship group, in, in, in church somehow, that patience is a key part of spiritual leadership. Paul says, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach Patiently enduring evil. We can patiently endure a lot of stuff, but evil is hard to come by. And it's a prerequisite for spiritual leadership. Those who preach the word, he says, are to do so with complete patience. 2 Timothy 4.2. Because God's word, sometimes people receive it, sometimes they don't. And most people are not going to jump on and be obedient the first time they hear a word from the Lord. Here's the company patience keeps. This is Paul's challenge to his his young uh, pastor friend, Timothy. And he challenges him with his own personal example. He says, you, however, Timothy, you followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. Patience even plays a role. Paul's, Paul's being attacked for doing exactly what God told him to do. He is under constant criticism, particularly that church in Corinth. They just give him fits And he defends his apostleship and his reputation with patience. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 4 through 6, 12, 12. At the heart of spiritual leadership in the Christian church is being an example to the flock. Jesus means for his church not only to have his example of perfect, perfect patience. That's how Jesus does it. But also that it be reflected in spiritual leadership. Imperfect though they may be. Fourth, patience and suffering. The aspect of patience likely hardest to cultivate is patience and suffering. It's one thing to to be patient with other people when you're feeling great and everything's good for you. It's another thing to be patient when, when your body hurts and when life is difficult for you and you're carrying your own burdens to then reach out to be patient to other people. How do you endure in pain and suffering. Will you have the wherewithal in trial? Not only to have patience with other people as you're going through your trials, but also, here's the big question, can you be patient with God? Because His timing is not our, our timing. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And so because God doesn't do it the way we do it, patience with God becomes a challenge. 
when his timing doesn't correspond with our preferences. Will we rejoice in hope? Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Looking to the prophets, uh, James 5.10 says, as an example of suffering and patience. God, God works in suffering and in suffering people to accomplish a purpose way beyond uh, what we might initially imagine for, for us, for our world, because he, he's, always, he's always working in us. He never wastes anything. Nothing is ever wasted in God's economy when it comes to suffering particularly. He always has a purpose for it that reaches way beyond just the moment. And some of it is to equip us to help others who go through the same thing. Here's what, here's what he says, 2 Corinthians 1. If we are afflicted, he's talking about himself, it is, for your own, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we're comforted, it's for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Five times in the first three chapters of Revelation, the Apostle John mentions a little for patient endurance because they're, they're experiencing challenges to their faith. It's hard to be a believer. There, there are constant pressures. There is physical, spiritual suffering taking place. He writes, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. And then he shows that his Christ source patient endurance, it multiplies. That in, in Revelation 2, 2 through 3, in verse 19, and then in 3.10, it just echoes out to the lives of John, John's followers, to other believers in Asia Minor, that through suffering, our testimony is expansive. And the fifth thing, patience with the second coming. We look at our world and the brokenness of it. We say, oh, Lord, when are you coming again? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. We look forward to the day we'd see him face to face when the rights are all, the wrongs are all made right. This great joy that awaits his coming. Romans 8, 25 says, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. How do you wait for the second coming of Christ? With great patience. Uh, James amplifies it in even a bigger way. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the for farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also, he says, be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. As we wait for the Lord in this broken world, we are called to do a couple things, to be patient as we wait, and in between here and there, to persevere, to be found faithful, to be true to him throughout the journey. Waiting patiently on Jesus' return is this climactic patience for the Christian. But it's not a patience of, I don't really care, God will do what he's going to do. It, it's, it's an intense longing. That this patience of waiting for the second coming, it's an aching of wanting it to come to pass. Uh, the, the old... Uh, the old uh, word uh, pine, you pine for it, you ache for it, you hurt, wishing for it, desiring it with all your hearts. You look around at our broken, sin-sick world and you just say, how long, O oh Lord? Well, that doesn't betray patience. In fact, uh, that pining for the second coming of Christ and being faithful until the end, it's the greatest demonstration, uh, expression of uh, the fruit of the Spirit, which is patience. Now, there's a lot of blessing you're never going to experience in this life until you learn patience, until you grow in this particular fruit. Because otherwise, you're always going to be frustrated, always going to be confused, and always going to be angry. And I know a lot of frustrated, confused, angry people who name the name of Christ because they're always waiting for something else and are impatient. I want to challenge you to grow in this particular fruit. Early on in my Christian walk, I heard the statement, oh my goodness, don't ever pray for patience. You ever heard that? Don't ever pray for patience. Well, I'm going to challenge you. Instead of doing something sinful, which is what that is, by the way, so 
I want to get that out of the way early because I don't want you to come up to me and go, oh, you know, you should never pray for patience, Chad. Because you're saying, I would like to be remain a sinner and enjoy my sin, so I can't leave you there. I have no patience with that. Pray for patience. Ask God to help you in this particular area. Now, it is true that sometimes to grow in patience, your patience will be challenged. Yet, the benefit package is so big on this particular fruit you don't want to pass it by. You don't want to skip it. You don't want to do an end around on patience. Ask God to help you in the fruit of patience. Because, because hope and peace and joy and all these things, that's what comes with the fruit of the Spirit is patience.